Oh, hello, and welcome once again to the Sage's Library. I am your humble sage, Trevor DeVal. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And if you do enjoy the channel and what I do here, please do hit like and subscribe. And if you want to support us on Patreon, the link for that is below. Also, brand new merchandise announced, handmade, right here. Amazing. You got your shirts, you got your drinking glasses, you got your dice bags, and there's going to be more in the future. But for now, you can go to the website at memyselfanddie.com if you want to help support the show through buying the merch. On to today's episode of the Sage Library. Today we're going to be talking about, I think, my favorite game ever. And that is Tall Order. Because, obviously I've played, well, all the games. This game was very heavily influenced by the simulationist games of the late 70s and early 80s. RuneQuest, first edition, first and second editions. Chivalry and Sorcery. These were really, really intricately detailed simulationist games. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, simulationist is just sort of a way of saying that the game is designed to put the players into as close to a real simulation of what it must be like to be in that fantasy world as possible. You know, obviously you never really get there, but that's kind of what that term means. Simulationist games have a heavy, heavy focus on intricate rule sets, quote unquote, realistic rules, things of this nature. So the game we're talking about today is, ho ho, Harn Master. This is Harn Master 3rd edition by Columbia Games, written by N. Robin Crosby, who was, I believe, a British person who spent a lot of time in Vancouver, BC, and where he founded the company, I believe which is uh, good news for me because I lived in Vancouver for uh, 15 years. So I feel a certain affinity to Robin Crosby, even though I never met the man. So there are two big products in this line, really. The product we're talking about today is Harn Master, the role-playing game. But there is also Harn the World, or as it is currently packaged, Harn World. These things are related, but not the same. Harn World is a setting. It is a system agnostic. It is a system neutral setting in which you can use any game you want. Okay. Harn Master was designed to be used in the Harn world, but you don't have to use Harn Master in order to use Harn. I'm going to talk about Harn in a separate episode because it is one of my favorite settings of all time, and I'll get into that in that episode. So the game is unapologetically simulationist. So it doesn't have things like universal mechanics, right? There's, it's not, you, you don't roll a d20 to achieve everything you want to do like you do in, say, D&D 5th edition. This game is largely based on percentile rolls. You have skills that are based on a number between 1 and 100, typically, and you got to roll that number or less, and you succeed. However, there's also stat rolls using d6s. So you might be in a situation where you have to roll 4d6 against your stat, which is between 3 and 18, typically. Uh, or 3d6, or 5d6, or 2d6, it all depends on the situation. So there's no universal mechanic in this game, which is a big indicator of its age, you know? And I don't mean that disparagingly at all, it's just that in the old days, we were a lot more free with using a bunch of different subsystems in order to achieve something. A game like Fate, which we'll get to at some point, because it's, it's in my library, really does the opposite. A game like Fate talks about a unified engine. In other words, you're always rolling 4D Fate or whatever variation of that uh, you're using in Fate. This game is not that, okay? You got mostly its percentiles, but sometimes it's uh, D6s against your stat. Now, when you first look at Harn Master, <laughs> when I first looked at Harn Master, it was many, many years ago, and it intimidated the hell out of me, I'm not gonna lie. When you look at the character sheet, the character sheet kind of looks like an IRS form with diagrams. <laughs> if you don't know what you're looking at, you, you go, oh my God, what is this? What you see in the character sheet is a bunch of crazy detailed hit locations and a bunch of categories and, and, and numbers that don't mean anything to you. And it's just like, what is this thing? You look at the combat tables at the charts and you think, what, what does any of this mean? I just want to roll my d20 to hit the orc. Well, yes, on the surface, it is very complex. However, when you learn the basics of it, when you, when you get into the groove of Harnmaster, you very quickly realize that the core engine moves fast, 
the percentile rolls, even the D6s, they move very quickly. It's all just a series of repetitive steps, like any combat is in any role-playing game, basically. But once you get it, it clicks in, and away you go. So it looks complex, uh, but it's not nearly as complicated as it is complex, if that makes sense. The other thing about Harnmaster Third is that it is eminently hackable. You can do all kinds of things to it to tailor it to exactly the specifications that you want. There's a, a rule set out there or a, a, a mod basically called Gantz House Rules, which I borrow heavily from in order to mod my own Harnmaster game. If you were to sit in on my Harnmaster game, you would certainly recognize it as being Harnmaster 3, no question but a lot of it would be different because I've heavily house ruled a bunch of things in order to, you know, maneuver the game to the, the kind of game that I want. The beautiful thing about this engine is that it can take those modifications without breaking down. You can hack this thing to pieces and put it back together and it all still works for the most part, which is great. For me, that's a sign of a really, really valuable kind of game engine because the more I can tinker with it, and, and get it to, to the kind of game that I want it to be, and the more it, it, it accommodates such tinkering, that's good design as far as I'm concerned. You know, I always try and play games by raw, by rules as written, when I first start, because I really want to understand the designer's intention before I go messing with it. And I did. I, I, when I started running Hardmaster Third. You know, obviously I played executive by the rules, but as time went on, I realized, oh, I think I can switch this to make this work a little better for me, and uh, it works great. Now, when you're talking about characters in this game, when you make characters for this game, you are making characters for an analog of Saxon slash Norman Britain circa 800 to 1200 AD, more or less. This game is, as I said, it's unapologetically simulationist, and it's also unapologetically an analog for a fantasy version of England. Okay, it's it's very apparent. The entire world of the game, and I'm not talking I'm not talking Harn World, I'm talking Harn Master the Game System. Everything about character creation is predicated upon the idea that you are playing in a feudal, medieval, and typically English or maybe French environment. When you're making characters, you're gonna be playing knights or priests or second sons or yeomen or peasant farmers or serfs. In fact, if you randomly roll, you'll probably wind up being a peasant farmer because the overwhelming majority of the island of Harn uh, or virtually any feudal society was peasant farmers. We never did that, though. My Harn Master games tended to be more like inspired by George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones. They were gritty. They were, there was a lot of political intrigue uh, and brutally violent, of course. This game really, really plays into that really well. You have stats in this game, much like you do in D&D. You've got your strength and dexterity and constitution, but you also have eyesight and hearing, and smell. Smell is a stat in this game. So you think to yourself, what possible use could that be? Well, as it turns out, quite a bit. Basically, every skill has a base number of an average of three stats. So something like perception in this game might be based on sight and hearing and smell. It's possible. Or, you know, if you're, if you're swinging a sword, it might be based on strength and strength and dexterity. You take those three numbers, you average them, and you get your base number upon which then you, you add. So there's a bunch of different stats that originally, when you look at it, you think, that looks really complicated. But they come into play. You know, that's the beauty. They give you the option of having a situation where in which a character's smell actually can save the day. And that has happened in my games. So it's, it's, it's nice to have that stuff available to you. So as I said, the skill system is basically percentiles. You roll D100 and you get your skill or under. If you get over, you fail. However... If you get doubles under your skill, that is a critical success. And if you get doubles over your skill, that is a critical failure. This is really simple, really elegant, and works really well. Those results, moderate success versus critical success, have different results based on whether it's a skill or whether it's a combat role or anything like that. But that's basically the core engine of the game when it comes to the percentiles. When it comes to skills, there are many options to dig deep into how you want to use those skills. For example, in, in one of my campaigns, the characters were traveling overland to a place and they basically had to hunt in order to survive. They needed to hunt, a, I think they were going after a big stag or something like that in the wilderness. So when they decided to hunt, there's a whole mini game involved in the, in the Harn Master rules about how to hunt, how to track and stalk your prey and take the shot and see if you can fell him in one shot. It's just really, really cool. If you like that, a lot of people don't, a lot of people want to get on with stuff, but if you do like it, oh man, it's a, it's a treasure trove of stuff. So combat, like everything else, is 
percentile based. You have attack scores and defense scores, they're, they are different. You might have a certain, you might have an 85 attack with your sword, but you might have a 65 parry or defense with your sword. Each, each weapon is different, each weapon is trained differently. And the biggest thing about the combat system and the thing that I love the most, which well, there's a lot I love about the most about this game, but one of the things I love the most about this game, which a lot of people hate, is detailed hit locations. Now, I know a lot of you out there are going, hit locations, they just get in the way, they don't add anything. Well, you're free to think that. In my case, I think hit locations add everything. Hit locations in a simulationist game like this inform so much of the outcome of what a single sword strike can do. It's not a matter of I hit you and do five hit points damage. There's no hit points in this game. We're going to come back to that in a second. But if I swing my sword and hit you in the left knee. And I took an arrow in the knee. Or I hit you in the right hand and then we determine it's this finger that gets hit. All of this is part of the rules. Now, you don't have to drill down that far, but the general rules assume you're going to be using these de uh, detailed hit locations, and that feeds into the armor system as well. When you, when you have armor, first of all, it's layered. So you could be wearing padded, and then you could have maybe a layer of leather on top of that. Maybe you have a, leather, uh, a layer of chain on top of that, and you add all those values together per hit location, depending on what it is. So if I'm wearing bracers, let's say. Well, that's going to cover my forearms, possibly my hand, possibly my upper arms as well, but not necessarily my shoulders. If I'm wearing a tunic, it might cover my chest and my abdomen, and my thorax. That's right, abdomen and thorax, but it's not going to do anything for my groin. <laughs> or maybe it does, I forget. Anyway, the point is, is it's all piece armor and it's layers. Now, you would think, well, why wouldn't you just wear all, all the armor you, you can? Well, A, it's very expensive. B, a lot of heavier armors are only uh, reserved for the nobility and for the knights, but that's a setting thing more than a game thing or a system thing. And C, the more armor you wear, the more encumbered you become. And encumbrance in this game is a real thing. The more encumbrance you have, the less you're going to be able to do anything, basically, unless it's like a mental task. Obviously, wearing heavy armor doesn't affect your thinking, but it certainly affects your movement and your ability to, to attack and defend yourself. So the more armor you have, the, the more encumbered you are. And the encumbered system is, is pretty punishing in this, but it also kind of makes sense. So it's again, it's a trade-off. Do I want to wear the armor and have the protection, or do I want to have mobility and be able to run around the battlefield? But with the detailed hit locations, you get a speedy resolution system, because once you learn the game, it gets very fast. You get a speedy resolution system with a really richly detailed description of what happens. If I attack somebody, if I attack an orc, let's say, with a spear, based on my attack roll and his defense roll, if I do hit him, I know exactly where I hit him. And a wound to the foot is very different than a wound to the hand. If I hit him in the left leg, let's say, or even the left foot, there's a chance he could stumble and fall down because he's been hit in the leg. If I hit him in the right hand, there's a chance he might drop his weapon. If I hit him in the head, there's a chance he might pass out. If I hit him anywhere, there's a chance he might undergo shock because in this game, a fight is over real quick. If I drive a six inch hunk of metal through your belly, you're probably not gonna die immediately from that, but the fight's over, man. You're gonna have to roll a shock roll, and if you fail that, you basically collapse to the ground, you know, clutching your belly, crying for your mother kind of thing. So it, 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 the, the game is extremely brutal, but not necessarily lethal. Much like Dominion Rules, which I use in season three of the main show of Me, Myself, and Die. I like that a lot. It gives combats meaningful consequences and a lot of tactical choices, but it's not necessarily going to mean that every time you're in a fight, you're going to die, because that's that's not fun, right? And it's still a game. It's still a game. So there's no hit points either. If I'm going to hit you, I'm going to do a wound, and that could be a minor wound, a severe wound, a grievous wound, a lethal wound. This is all determined by the chart, the, the combat chart that, that you use to resolve fights. These wounds penalize you. The more wounds you have, especially little wounds, it's like the it's like death by a thousand cuts, right? The more little wounds you have, the more penalties you accrue, and pretty soon you're just so exhausted from all these wounds, you essentially collapse, right? Or, or you're unable to strike back. Conversely, if I hit you for a grievous wound, that might now you know give you a 30% penalty to anything you do. That's a big roll, considering most people's skills are going to be around 60 or something like that. So. Wounds add up, and wounds take time to heal, and also, wounds can get infected. That is built into the healing rules, which I love. It makes healers really important, and I'm not talking D&D-style priests, although they can exist if you, if you choose. I'm talking 
what the, what Harnmaster calls physicians, medieval doctors, basically, who are doing their best to try and staunch the bleeding and to, to repair the damage and to prevent infection. Because infection in our own world killed more people than virtually anything else. And so it is in Harn. It's, it's definitely a, a threat. And I love that that is... is looming in the background and it has to be it has to be dealt with healing is a process all unto itself when you take damage you know it's, it's going to take some time to heal not months and months and months necessarily because again that's not super fun especially if you're in the middle of an adventure but it's going to take some some time and that can lead to really wild things there was a an instance in one of the campaigns i ran where one of the characters got in a fight with a mortal enemy and they both wounded each other so badly that they both basically collapsed and somebody else took them, some good Samaritan or whatever the case was, I forget the details. And they basically were in this cabin in the woods in the, in the wilderness healing. But they were both so damaged by the debilitating wounds that they had each caused each other that they could basically just, you know, <laughs> lay in their cots on the opposite sides of the cabin and stare at each other for days and days while they were slowly tended to by this Good Samaritan and, and while they slowly got better. But what that did was it created the situation where these two mortal enemies had time and the inability to attack each other. They wound up communicating and they wound up creating sort of this grudging respect for each other. And later in the campaign, the, that mortal enemy became a hugely valuable friend to that character. So it turned out great. And that was all because of the healing rules. Like GURPS, this game has a lot of dials and switches that you can dial up or dial down based on the complexity you want. You do not have to turn on all of the options. You don't have to have, say, the armor damage rule so that if someone stabs you with a spear, you check the damage for the armor to see if it gets punctured. Or if you parry with a, a mace, you know, to check the weapon quality on the mace to make sure it doesn't get broken. You can use all that, but you don't have to. Again, I love that. I love that modular aspect because it allows you to tailor the game to exactly the level of, of complexity that you want. The magic system, really, really cool. Really, really tailored to the world itself. Interestingly enough, in my campaigns, I never used that. I, in fact, converted the Ars Magica magic system. It, it wasn't hard to do, actually. It was quite easy. In fact, if if you're interested, I can put those rules up on uh, on my website at me-myself-and-die.com. The included magic system is really neat. And the, the the way magic works is really neat. And the philosophy behind magic, it's all it's all very cool. I should point out that in the base rules, if you if you do buy the rules, you don't actually get a lot of uh, specifics about priests or wizards. You have to buy separate supplements for that. That That's one of the drawbacks of the game is that when you buy Harnmaster 3, the core rules, you're not getting all the core rules. You're getting everything you need to play like a guy with a sword, but if you want to play a Sheikh Bavar or a priest or anything like that, you probably want to invest in the other supplements. I prefer games that have everything in one big book, like Warhammer First Edition, for example, uh, but that's just a preference. Um, again, it, it doesn't prevent me from loving Arn. I, I love Arn Master as it is. So basically, if you love quick moving games, very narrative based games with a unified mechanic and a lot of meta currencies for your players to affect the narrative outside of what their play what their player characters could do. This is not your game. This is definitely not your game. Go play fate. <laughs> Go play something else. But if you like really detailed, brutal, greedy games along the lines of a Game of Thrones, if you like political intrigue, if you love feudal settings, if you love medieval fantasy, and if you love a game that really gets into the guts in more ways than one of what it must be like to exist in such a milieu, then Harnmaster is for you, for sure. I have had some of the greatest campaigns I have ever run as a GM in this game system and in this world, and that is why Harnmaster will always have one of the most valued and hallowed spots on these shelves here in the Sages Library. And if you're interested, you should check out the Columbia Games website or perhaps on Drive Through RPG and check out Harn for yourself. You might like it. Thanks so much for joining me. Again, if you enjoy the content, please do hit like and subscribe. And if you want to help support the channel on Patreon, you can do that with the link below or uh, buy some of the merchandise if you uh, so choose at the website me, myself, and die.com. Thank you so much, and we shall see you next time on the Sages Library.